Um, so my name is Kurt Knoll. I've been at Barnabas Foundation for 17 years. I'm an accountant by background. Um, I haven't done accounting in about 10 years, so I often say and joke I'm a recovering accountant. Um, but I have the privilege and, and pleasure at, as an, at the organization of going around and talking to donors about opening their minds about ways to give differently. And so that's what we'll talk a little bit about today. Um, so who we are as Barnabas Foundation is we help generous Christians transfer their wealth in ways that honor God provides for their heirs and provides for their favorite charities. And that's ultimately, that's the tagline of who Barnabas Foundation is. Um, we do that through planning conversations, which is really estate planning conversations. Um, we assist people with asset-based giving during their lifetime. Um, and we also provide life income gifts as well. So we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. Founded in 1976. So we've been around for 48 years. Um, we are a membership-driven organization, CBE is a member of ours. They're part of a collective of about 215 or so charities around the country that are all contributing members to the foundation. And we partner with them providing this expertise to their development teams and to their donors. <clears throat> um, we've done well over $200, $2 billion worth of planned bequest expectancies to date um, and distributed, that says 1.2 million, it's actually $1.2 billion to charity over our last 48 years. Um, and have roughly about $800 million in assets under management today at the organization. Um, when we think about smarter ways to give, um, we're often talking to people about the fact that to be a good steward of your resources, you need to understand all your giving options, right? It's, there's more ways to give than just writing a check. We know about sharing our time. We know about sharing our talents. We know about providing financial resources. Sometimes those financial resources can come in different forms than just a check or cash gift. And many people that we work with are often asking us, how can I make a bigger impact in my giving? And so that's what we'll talk about. Um, <clears throat> we've worked with thousands upon thousands of donors. We've distributed gifts to thousands of churches and hundreds and uh, thousands of ministries actually around the country. So when we talk about smarter ways to give, we're talking about three main categories. Non-cash asset gifts, gifts that provide you an income stream, or gifts in a will, or that last act of stewardship that you have, right? When you, all those things you've cared for that the Lord's blessed you with during your lifetime, how do you transfer that at the end of your life? A gift in a will. When we think about non-cash assets, we're talking about all those things that are on your balance sheet that you own. Stocks, your real estate, if you own a business, the interest in that business, um, your retirement assets. Um, if you're a farmer, the farm commodities that you raise, um, machinery and other valuables, cryptocurrency, all those things, those other assets outside of besides the cash that's sitting in your, your bank account. Why people do this is because it often allows them to make a gift that costs them less. What do I mean by that? Is if you were an investor or in the early days of pick a company, Amazon, and you invested $1,000 in Amazon, and that stock now is worth $10,000. You can gift that $10,000 position, or $5,000 of it, or some portion of it. But what did it really cost you? Right? You do have it. It's still valuable to you, but your cost was the entry point in which you actually bought the asset for. Okay? Gifts like this are not constrained by your cash flow. Oftentimes when we're responding to an ask, it's usually based on what do I have in my checking account and what does my income look like during that period of time? And so you're, you're primarily responding to all generous or all donation requests from that perspective. When you think about giving differently, think about it from an asset-based perspective, um, it allows you to respond differently. You do get a tax deduction for the full value of the asset at the time in which you made the gift. Um, so whatever that fair market value is, you'll get a deduction for that. Um, but you'll also avoid the liability that's due, the capital gains liability, okay? And that's where some of this cost less comes in as well. If you bought a stock, Amazon, for $1,000, and it's worth ten, if you sold that in your portfolio today, you'd have a $9,000 gain. And you would pay 20% of that in taxes to the government, which is another form of charity. Just may not be a charity I want to support. So that'd be about 1,900 bucks you'd end up, or $1,800 you'd end up paying in taxes on that transaction. If you give it, that tax liability goes away. It just disappears and evaporates because the charity pays no tax when they sell the security. So it's a double win. 
you get the deduction for 10,000 and you avoid the tax liability. There's also the, the, the ability to eliminate carrying costs or hassle of ownership factor. If you've owned a piece of real estate, perhaps, and you've owned it for a very long time, it's appreciated significantly, you've enjoyed the cash flow on it, but you're tired of owning it, or perhaps you're thinking about, let's put it in a different context, a second home. Perhaps you have a condo in Naples that you're not going to anymore, the kids don't go there, you're owning it, you got a management company, you're dealing with all these things, maybe you're just tired of it. It's a way to eliminate the carrying costs and hassle factor, continue to own that asset by making a gift to your favorite charities with it. And keep in mind, when, you, when I talk about making a gift like this, it's not that you have to make a gift of the entire thing. It can be a portion thereof, especially with real estate. Um, many people ask us oftentimes, do I have to give you the whole thing? No, you can give us an undivided interest. 10%, 20%, 50%, whatever percent makes the sense for you to make gift-wise. Is there a way to give a surplus to eliminate the capital gain costs? Yes. Yeah, and that's we can play with the calculations and often do with people. Um, if, if we're looking at a particular situation and the appreciation is X and we know the tax amount would be, so then we can back in the calculation and say, what would the deduction need to be in order to wipe the tax out? And we do that quite frequently. And feel free to ask any questions along the way if you have any questions at all. Um, ways you can make these gifts, you can make them direct to your ministry, right? So you can make them direct to CBE. Now, wonderfully about CBE is if you called them up and said, I want to give you some farmland in Idaho, they're going to say, call Barnabas Foundation because they partnered with us to do it. But many charities have internal resources that do process these types of gifts. Um, you can use a donor advised fund as another way. We'll talk about what a donor advised fund is in just a minute. Or if you said to me, this is all great, it's a wonderful idea, I love the idea of giving this home or something to you, but I still need the income stream that it's generating. I still need the income stream off this rental property. Can I do this somehow? And that's what a life income agreement does. And we'll talk in details about that. So in these situations, it allows a donor to make a gift of an appreciated asset typically, and they get an income stream for their lifetime or in the case of a married couple, for both of your lifetimes. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about Dan and Mary. Dan and Mary were friends of mine. I went to church with them. They were a wonderful couple, devoted their lives to Christian education. But when you work in a Christian school environment, you generally don't qualify for Social Security. So the only retirements they get was whatever the school pension system was and whatever else they saved. So smartly, when they were young, they bought a couple of rental duplexes. Now, Dan was being visited by a, um, a, a representative from a charity. And Dan came into the house. He was running late and he was all flustered. Keep in mind, Dan's 88 years old. He was just at one of the rental units dealing with a clogged toilet. Dan's wife, Mary, is in assisted living because she's got memory issues. Now, they were both living in an assisted living kind of facility at that point in time. But Dan came in and he's flustered and he's talking about this. And the gentleman that he was meeting with from the ministry said, Dan, there's a way to do this. There's a way for you to make a gift of this asset, still get an income stream, get a partial tax deduction, and eliminate the hassle of ownership. Well, once Dan heard that, he wanted to know more. He brought, they brought him into our office. We ran all the calculations and walked through the process and showed him the pros and cons. And in the end, they put 60% of their duplexes into a charitable remainder trust. And they did 60% because that wiped out the liability on the 40% that they kept. Yes? So we then, the, the trust, the charitable remainder trust now owns the building. The trust sells the building. The assets are converted into investable assets so I can invest them in the market and so forth because the trust now has to pay him an income stream. And so we need the trust to be producing in return. But that capital gains tax that was due on that 60%, just, it just got absorbed by the trust. And it's essentially paid out over the lifetime of the donor that way. And then you guys handled the sale of the real estate. We did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we own, well, in that case, because we only own 60% of it, we had to work with him still. Yeah. Because when we went to closing, it was 60% us, 40% him. But so there's lots of scenarios like that, but we would be the integral part to that portion that's gifted. Okay. Um, 
these investment, these, I don't want to say investment vehicles, but these vehicles, these life income agreements are very attractive to seniors because they're often on fixed income. They often have these assets that they need to divest from. Um, they're worried about paying the capital gains tax. They, they want to provide for charity and so forth. Um, there's two forms, generally speaking, two forms, charitable gift annuities, charitable remainder trusts. Charitable gift annuities is a fixed obligation that the charity commits to pay to that donor for the rest of their life. The trust is its own kind of living entity. It has a more complicated tax structure. Um, the trust can actually fold and go away, whereas the annuity agreement is a contractual liability. So a couple different forms, but oftentimes we figure out what's best based on the needs of the donor and the asset that we're dealing with at the time that they're funding. Um, what does this allow donors to do? <clears throat> Often allows them to make a gift that's larger than they thought was possible. We hear that all the time. When we, do, when we talk to donors and show them how this works and run calculations on it, they're, they're actually amazed sometimes at what they're able and capable of providing for charity in these agreements. Um, they get that immediate tax deduction, as I talked about. It's not for the full value of the asset gifted because you're retaining an income stream. So there's a calculation we have to go through. The IRS has calculation tables we use. Generally speaking, it's going to be somewhere between 40 and 60% of the value of the asset because you retain that income stream. Um, <clears throat> often done with cash and non-cash assets. Cash gifts are typically done with gift annuities um, at non-cash assets, typically go into charitable remainder trusts. And as I mentioned before, when we sell the asset inside these vehicles, there's no tax. There's no tax hit, which is beautiful. So imagine a farmer who's farmed his entire life um, he owns a few hundred acres, maybe a thousand acres of land. And that acreage is now worth hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. And now they're retiring. The kids watch mom and dad slug through life farming and they want no part of it. That's why we're seeing more and more corporate farms growing and growing. But they're really afraid of just selling this asset outright because of the 20% tax hit. This becomes a way in which they can carve that out, put some or all of that land into a trust. The trust sells the asset, there's no tax due, which means the full value of the asset is now being used to generate an income stream for their lifetime. And these provided for charity at the end of their lives. And got a tax deduction up front that they can use for this year as well as up to five years forward, depending if they can use the full amount or not. Gifts and a will. Most common form of gift that can be done, everyone has an estate. Doesn't matter the size, it's just a factor of zeros. Whether Elon Musk worth hundreds of billions of dollars or the widow that we've worked with that had $5,000 left to her name. Everyone has an estate. And you, through your estate plan, which really is your final act of stewardship, right? It's your final little piece of worship that you're going to do, you know, with your passing. It allows you to pass that on in a God-glorifying way to either your heirs, which if necessary, and that has to be 100% then that we understand, or to your heirs and from your favorite charities. Um, these are done through wills, they're done through trusts, they're done through beneficiary designations, lots of other things that go along with this, but it's done at the end of one's life. And we often use just a general term saying gift in a will because it's simple and easy and just kind of an all-encompassing term. Oftentimes, these types of gifts can extend your giving well out of your well outside of your lifetime. So I'm working on an estate right now at the foundation. Um, the gentleman was a successful businessman. It was about a $30 million net worth. Enormously generous man. 95% of his estate is going to charity. His kids, successful in their own right, didn't really need any gifts. But what he decided to do, because the magnitude of the gifts that he's giving relative to the size of the ministries he's giving them to, he's actually asked for part of the estate that's going to charity to be distributed to the charities over a decade. Now it provides a very stable funding source for these charities for at least the next 10 years. And he was one of their major donors. And so this has become very, very valuable to the ministries themselves. And so, and we have a number of people that do that, especially when we get to larger estates. So it really allows you to extend your giving well beyond your lifetime. Um, oftentimes, these are the largest gifts that many donors are ever going to make. There was a donor we worked with who was a steady monthly donor to a ministry for decades. But she gave like $5 a month, $10 a month to this ministry. 
So her total giving to the ministry over her lifetime was like $2,800 or something like that. No, no one's radar screen from a development perspective, but she had called us and we worked on her plan. She left $428,000 to that ministry. Amazing, amazing gift. And that's the kind of legacies that people are able to leave through doing gifts in a will. Uh, the nice thing about these types of gifts is that you still have full control and retain the asset during your lifetime. So, and it does happen. People live longer than expected. They go into assisted living. Perhaps they have a long-term illness at the end of their life. We've seen estates exhaust themselves. Okay. Or perhaps they have a new grandchild that has a special circumstance and their assets now have to be re-diverted somewhere else. The flexibility for that is there through gifts in a will. And you can change this over time, right? If you do develop a will, you can always change it five years from now. Types of options that we've seen people do. We've seen people tithe. They give 10% of their estate. We have a concept that we've worked with for years and years and years called child named charity. If you have three kids, have a fourth one named charity. Divide it four ways instead of three ways. You know, people look at the magnitude of that adjustment for each of the children. They're like, that's okay. That's not that bad. Instead of getting one third, they're getting a quarter. And they're often pretty surprised at how that works out. Um, other fixed percentages, they give specific assets. They can also specifically name specific accounts like IRAs, other retirement assets, life insurance. You can do direct beneficiary things on certain types of things, uh, assets along the way. Do you do that in life insurance? Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Some of our shrewdest donors that we've worked with have been, um, uh, they've invested heavily in uh, whole life insurance mm -hmm. and they've grown substantially in value. And the cash value now is generating dividends enough to cover the premium. But these are like $3 million policies that that's going to become their charitable gift. And um, pretty, pretty powerful if it's done right at, at the right age. They'll name the charity or they'll name a donor advised fund or something like that. So... Um, a couple other things that we'll talk about, and, and I'm happy to take questions and hang around and talk to anybody about you know, any questions or, or specific issues you have for your particular household. Um, but IRA QCDs, now it's interesting. I don't think anybody in the room here qualifies, right? IRA QCDs are available to when you're one, you reach the age of 70 and a half. So just be, mind, be aware of this. When you reach the age of 70 and a half, you can make a gift directly from your IRA to your favorite charities up to $105,000 this year for each person who owns an IRA. So if a husband and wife, they have their own separate IRAs, they can do 105 each. And that is now indexed for inflation, so it's gonna go up every year. Yes? So they then avoid, they avoid any tax liability by taking it on the IRA and giving it to charity? Yep, so the couple of benefits of why would somebody do this? Well, for one, it does avoid any, they don't recognize the income, so there's never a taxable event for them. Two, it also offset any RMD requirement that they have. Okay. So if your RMD is $10,000 and you make a $10,000 gift to charity from your IRA, it wipes out the RMD. Okay. If you do a $5,000 gift to charity and you have a $10,000 RMD, you're now, your RMD has been reduced to $5,000. So you can see how that direct offsets that. Okay. Um, and as mentioned, they're, they're tax-free. One question that comes up all the time is, can I make a gift from my IRA to my donor advised fund? The answer right now to that is no. But there are other ways to do it outside of a donor advised fund, and we're going to talk about what a DAF is next. Donor advised funds have been around, we think, since the early 30s, but have really gained in popularity in the last decade. Think of it like a giving checking account, Okay or a replacement to the classic private foundation that a lot of families established. You make gifts into your donor advice fund and you get a tax deduction at the time in which you make the gift, okay? It can be cash, it can be assets. We have farmers that give corn and soybeans and, and you know, apples and cherries and you name all kinds of farm commodities into their DAF. Um, they do business interests, real estate, cryptocurrency, all kinds of stuff. The DAF will sell the asset, right? Same way with the trust, there's no tax. So any capital gains tax that was due 
or income tax in the case of something like a farm commodity gift, it's sold without tax effect, okay? And you get a tax deduction for the full value of it when you put it into the DAF. Double win again, right? Tax avoidance, tax deduction. Um, then you retain the right to advise on where those distributions would go to charity. It can be immediate, it could be over decades, it could be next year, it could be at any time frame you desire. Currently, there's no regulations that require you to make a gift out of your DAF in any time frame. There is talk and some regulations proposed that we'll see if they get passed that may require a 15 year window, I think, for every gift, but we'll, the, the industry will just adapt. Um, we typically deal with initial gifts to fund an account at $10,000 or more. Most of the DAF providers out there are at that level or higher um, because this isn't really designed to be for small dollar types of giving. It's designed for a more substantial use. Um, and donors of all ages can use this, right? We have donors that use this as a replacement to their annual giving. And they make a single gift in once a year. The asset that was gifted is sold and they send out 10 checks of $5,000 each or something to their favorite charities. And the balance is just zero for the rest of the year. Keeps it simple, single tax uh, receipt for their accountant. Their accountant's happy, he's not trying to find all the receipts for all the charitable gifts they've made over the course of the year. And there's an easy record um, to keep track of from that perspective, right? We have donors that have used it at times in which they've been accumulating assets because they know they're gonna be asked to be a lead or a, a, a significant giver to a capital campaign. Out by me in Northwest Indiana, the Christian high school that was in Illinois wanted to move across the border and they were gonna do a $25 million campaign. And the donor who was the lead giver, of a $2 million lead gift, he built up his account with us over four years because they knew that they were, it actually took them almost 10 years to get this whole thing done and actually make the move, but the donor knew he was gonna be asked to make a $2 million gift, so we started setting it aside each year for four years. Um, we have donors that do it at times of divestitures, right? They're selling a the farm, they're selling a the business, and they wanna carve out 10%, 20, 30, whatever percentage is for charity, they'll make a gift at that time. When that asset is preparing to be sold, they avoid the tax on that portion, and then they have those assets free and clear to give to whatever charities they want to, again, over any time frame. And we have those high income earning years. Some people that is, we have some young folks that are in their thirties and forties that are in the tech business and they're just, <laughs> the income's just flowing. And so, and they're just putting the money away as fast as they can to maximize out the amount that they can deduct every year, right? And so they, they know they're gonna give that money away to charity at some point in time, but right now they need to just minimize their income because they don't wanna pay extra taxes that they don't have to pay, okay? Uh, advantages, I, we touched on some of this. Avoid the capital gains. Um, you have time to choose your recipients. Uh, what programs you wanna fund. If you know new programs are coming, things like that allows you to set aside those funds. Um, it's much less costly and burdensome than, than doing a private family foundation. If you have the assets that are getting to 25 or $50 million or more in your charitable component, then a private family foundation may make sense. This is a much more cost-effective and easy way to do your charitable giving. Um, simplifies the gifting process. This allows for anonymity too. So you can make a gift from your DAF and you do not have to reveal who you are. This is important for some donors. Um, and it's really flexible. And the tools now that are available online, it's almost like logging into your online banking system and requesting a grant to be sent to this charity and you can set it up to be recurring, you can set it up to be post-dated, you can set it up all kinds of different ways, and you just hit send and it populates right into the systems, the checks are sent out, um, and if you don't wanna be anonymous, your name will be, an address will be included in the remittance, and that way they can properly thank you um, after the gift's been received, okay? There's a lot of donor advised fund platforms, we call ours a steward fund. We've been operating ours since the 80s, um, there's a number of large Christian nonprofits out there that do this, as well as a number of secular-based banking centers that also have this. So think Fidelity Schwab Vanguard, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley. They all have DAF programs now in charitable divisions. And that's smart and powerful giving. I knew it wouldn't take me an hour to go through this, but this is the world of where people do give differently. So... 
On the table outside, there's some brochures. Uh, there's a general brochure about Barnabas Foundation um, on, on these type of topics. There's also a brochure about our partnership with CBE um, and some other materials, including our Generosity Today magazine that we publish uh, three times a year. So if you'd like that, there's a way to subscribe to that. We mail it out, uh, as I mentioned, every, I think three times a year, if I recall. Um, and my card. So if you have any interest in wanting to connect with us, I'll be here for a couple more hours. Um, and then I have a flight this afternoon home.